Hafidei. The Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Hagatnya Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs now convenes this public hearing. Public hearing notices were distributed to the media and stakeholders. The first notice was issued on Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019, and the second notice on Friday, September 6th, and Sunday, September 8th, 2019. For the record, today is Tuesday, September 10th, 2019, and the time is now 1.05 in the afternoon. On the agenda for this morning's confirmation hearing are Donald H. Rubenstein to serve as a member on the COSAS Board of Advisors for the Guam Museum, Donovan L. Brooks to serve as a member on the Board of Trustees for the Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporation, also known as KGTF PBS, Rosemary A. Clement to serve as a member on the Board of Trustees for the Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporation, Maximo P. Ronquillo, Jr., to serve as a member on the Board of Directors for the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency, as well as Vincent J. Regis, to serve as a member on the Board of Directors for the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency. So it's a pretty full afternoon. The committee will hear testimony from E. Magahaga's nominees, as well as the oral testimony from those wishing to testify. The committee will also accept written testimony that will be made a part of today's public record. The conduct for this public hearing shall be as follows. Those testifying will be recognized in the order that they appear on the sign-up sheet. Written testimony may be read. Lengthy written testimony should be summarized to about five minutes. Written testimony shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide our legislative staff with your written testimony for photocopying. Testimony shall be confined to the substance. Persons will be allowed to present oral testimony only once. Once you are done, you may be asked to remain in the room for questions or for additional testimony as may be desired. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. Please then state your name clearly into the microphone for the record. We will now begin the confirmation hearing of E. Makahaga's nominee, Donald H. Rubenstein, to serve as a member on the COSAS Board of Advisors for the Guam Museum. And I want to remind those testifying that before you speak, to play, please make sure the microphone is on and that you speak clearly into the microphone and state your name for the record. So we are fortunate enough here to have uh, Donald Rubenstein. So if you will begin your testimony, please. Thank you for coming today. Have a day, Senator. I uh, feel very honored to be nominated to the COSAS Guam Museum Board. I've been a resident of Guam for 31 years and an employee of the University of Guam uh, since I first came here in 1988 to um, take the position as the three-year appointment as director of the Micronutionary Research Center at the University of Guam. And uh, in addition to the written material that I submitted, I just want to mention a few items in my background that uh, are not in the written material. <clears throat> Museums have always held a fascination for me. I, I can remember as a kid skipping school in Washington, D.C. to take a bus down and roam around in the Smithsonian. And uh, when I first came to Guam, I remember the old Guam Museum and spent many visits there. I've worked closely with the uh, museum, Guam Museum staff in the last uh, few years. We did a major e exhibition of uh, the artist Paul Jacolet and um, uh, it's been a great pleasure working with them. I'm very much looking forward to serving on the board. I uh, think there's a great potential for the museum and um, uh, it's a very important and very needed institution in Guam. I am happy to take uh, questions. I know this is a tight schedule, so um, I don't want to duplicate material that I already submitted in writing. So I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Senator. 
So just Masi for that. Um, it's very helpful background. And uh, you point out a few things. So it's not everybody who skips school to go to a museum. <laughs> so I think that speaks very much in your favor. <laughs> and I know from years of experience, knowing you for many years and observing the work that you do, that your work with uh, the Paul Jacolet material that you're very meticulous, you're very conscientious, you're very detail-oriented, and then everything that you produced from the booklets to the exhibit uh, ended up being quite exquisite and uh, something that they could really be proud of. And that I believe you were also even invited to Europe, I forget the country, but where they were having an exhibit, I think it was France. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit of that experience and, and some of your knowledge about copyright issues dealing with artists? Yes, you're right. That was a exhibit at the Musée de Cape Branly in 2013 in Paris. And uh, I was invited to write the lead essay in the museum's catalog uh, because I had worked with uh, Paul Jacolet's adopted daughter when we did the 2007 exhibit in Guam. I had a chance to go through uh, her collection that she inherited from her adopted father and to retrieve a lot of information on the Tremoral subjects who had served as models for Jacolet's uh, first series, his Rainbow series. Um, we were able to retrieve the names of the individuals and publish, <coughs> publish them for the first time. When we had the um, exhibition um, in Paris, this was the first time, ironically, that Jacolet was exhibited in the country of his birth. And uh, as part of that exhibition, the Jacolet estate in Tokyo gave 3,000 items to the Paris Museum. And um, we were able to get high resolution photocopies of those materials that became the basis for our Guam show. So there was a great deal of adherence to proper copyright and acknowledgement. We worked with Jacolet's copyright agency uh, in, um, uh, in New York, they use an agency in New York. Um, and this is uh, an issue which is uh, relevant to any museum exhibit to uh, acknowledge copyright and, and fair use. So uh, thank you for that uh, very complimentary introduction. Uh, my pleasure, definitely. And in looking through some of the material you provided and then of course for knowing you for a, a quite a long time as well, um, you have worked as a, po a po postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Hawaii. You've been a visiting professor in Germany. You've been a visiting researcher in Japan. You've been out here for the last 30 years. One of your uh, special focuses, if you will, has been studying Micronesian culture and Pacific culture and, and other parts. I know you've looked at um, art, textiles, so I just see that you bring so much of this background and experience, this knowledge with you that I think will really work very well at COSAS. Is there anything you know about the body of advisors where you see um, a particular focus that you'd like to be working on or a particular need? Uh, maybe you know some of the members already who are there? Yes, I have worked um, with uh, Domenica um, and, of course, with uh, Monica and Clifford and the Glidey organization. Um, I have uh, visited all of the major areas in Micronesia and watched the uh, development of the new Yap Museum. I've donated some material to them. And I think that one uh, potential avenue for future development for the Guam Museum is to link more closely with the regional museums in Micronesia and um, to work with them and with the uh, Pacific Island Museum Association uh, to develop criteria and, uh, and uh, cataloging uh, techniques that can aid the whole region and also perhaps working towards some sharing and circulation of materials and exhibits. Uh, I think that this is an exciting time in the region because um, several uh, areas are working to construct or rebuild their museums 
there is um, the App Historical Museum that is now moving into a second phase to develop a uh, temperature and humidity controlled facility. Uh, Palau has uh, two excellent museums, their National Museum and the private Etbison Museum. In the Marshall Islands, the Aleli Museum is, is trying to resurrect its uh, program after some financial problems over the last 10 years. Um, so I, I think that uh, this is a very good time for the Guam Museum to position itself working with these other regional organizations on common concerns. I think you've outlined that very well and it really helps us understand what's going on in the region and the fact that you can do that at a moment's notice uh, with a simple question I think again really speaks to what you're bringing with you uh, at the possibility of being a board member of the advisory body. And also in looking through the material that you provided, you served for many years with the Faculty Senate at the University of Guam, uh, serving as president and vice president. You were with the faculty union. You served for many years with the Guam Humanities Council board member. And I think those are very important for us to, to know that are part of your background. Um, one of the things that we've seen over the years is that many boards are not able to function because they're not meeting quorum. And so I think that really signals to us that you understand the commitments that are involved, the time, and um, that you have shown yourself, you've already demonstrated that if you accept something, you will be quite committed to that. Uh, do you foresee any conflicts of interest? No, I do not foresee any conflicts of interest in uh, my taking this position on the COSAS board. And I would like to uh, thank you for noting some of the uh, background on my um, um, written material. And I would say that probably the activity at the university that's given me the most personal reward has been teaching in the Microgen Studies program. And I'm particularly proud of our graduates. As you know, as one of our graduates, uh, we have produced um, uh, what I see as the next generation of leadership on the island. Um, so. Um, I uh, uh, have served on the thesis committee committees and chaired thesis committees since 1994 when we first started the program. And um, that's been a real source of, of uh, pride and pleasure for me. So thank you. So just Masi for uh, bringing up some of those issues. And it's true, as a Micronesian Studies uh, graduate student, that is where I first was taking some of your classes. And I got to know just the extent of your knowledge um, and the responsibility that you feel to a community. Um, I think I learned a lot about both of those aspects from you. And one of the things uh, that has always meant a lot to me was understanding your commitment to a community. That was something that was really impressed upon me. Um, I will also mention, and perhaps you'd like to talk about it a bit, I do think it's important that you noted that connection. In fact, I was just having a conversation a little bit earlier today about how sometimes in our island communities we can get these great gaps between uh, those that are serving in certain positions, in specialized positions, in museums, in our co other cultural agencies and offices, and that if we're not active with the university's institutions or just as a community keeping that in mind, it can be 10, 20, 30 years that we're not cultivating the next generation. And so I think that you have those sort of things in mind um, and you will be a very good connection between the museum and what goes on at the university. They also have the HITA program. And so this amongst other places that are the responsibility that the advisory board can bring. Um, I, I think that there may be something that you can bring to that as well, um, helping them build on what has proved to be a very um, important part of what the museum offers. Um, having these specialized studies or others in the community uh, that have certain knowledge or certain experiences and bringing that to the community. Uh, have you had any thoughts on the HITA 
program, uh, those evening lectures or afternoon lectures that they do sometimes? Yes, I, I did give one Hita lecture in conjunction with the Jacolet exhibit, and I've attended uh, a number of them. I think they're very useful. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm proud to see people from the university taking part in those, and I would like to see a closer relationship between our university and our Guam Museum. Uh, I've worked with the University of Guam's Isla Art Gallery since I first uh, came to the University of Guam in 1988. I've been on their board of advisors since that time, and I've um, curated uh, three exhibits at the um, Isla Gallery. Uh, I think that there is a lot of potential for collaboration and cooperation between the Isla Art Gallery at the University of Guam and the Guam Museum. I like what you outlined very much, and I do agree that uh, I think what you're saying, that there is a lot of potential for collaboration on the island. We do have these uh, different entities like Isla that can, um, the museum can be collaborating with more so. And then also these regional institutions, specific institutions and beyond. But uh, I know that they have some really interesting aspects to their collections, that they have that connected history um, or shared history uh, in some way or the other or similar cultural traits and material culture. So I think that certainly there's a lot to be gain by us um, continuing to explore those avenues. So thank you for all of those points that you've been making. If there's nothing further that you'd like to add, is there anyone else who has not testified, who wishes to testify? I know that the, um, the head of the Department of Tomorrow Affairs, I'm sure she would be testifying here, but she's off island in Hawaii right now, uh, helping us prepare for FESPAC. So um, she's there doing that. There being none, this concludes the confirmation hearing for Donald H. Rubenstein to serve as a member on the COSA's Board of Advisors for the Guam Museum. As a reminder, the committee will continue to receive testimonies for the next few days. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on the Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Hagatnya Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs, and submit it to office.senatorkelly at guamlegislature.org or to my office, which is located on the second floor of the Guam Congress building. So we'll take a brief recess before we begin the next confirmation hearing. Sidus Masi. Thank you very much, Senator.
Half a day and good evening to Dus Maasi for coming out this afternoon. We will now begin the confirmation hearing of E. Magahaga's nominee, Mr. Donovan L. Brooks, to serve as a member on the Board of Trustees, Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporation, also known as KGTF PBS. Again, to reinstate this committee's general housekeeping rules, the conduct of this public hearing shall be as follows. Those testifying will be recognized in the order of those that have signed in. Written testimony may, may be read. Lengthy written testimony should be summarized to about five minutes. Written testimonies shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide our legislative staff with your written testimony for photocopying if you have not already done so. Testimony shall be confined to the substance, and persons will be allowed to present oral testimony only once. Once you are done, please remain at the table so that the members of the panel are able to request for additional comments or convey comments on your testimonies. When you speak, please make sure the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. And then please state your name for the record. So I will go ahead and call forward uh, Mr. Brooks. And I just want to note that we do have others who are here providing support, and uh, some have provided some written testimony. So we have Ms. Ina Carrillo, who is the station manager for PBS Guam, and Christine Flores de la Cruz. Thank you also for providing support. Um, I, I think we'll do them separately. That way, uh, each one is their own committee report. Yeah. So, welcome, Mr. Donovan. Thank you so much. Um, I'll go ahead and pull out some points from the station manager's testimony. She notes that you've been the chairman of PBS Guam for the past two administrations, and she strongly recommends that you con continue to serve in that capacity. She has noted that you are an outstanding supporter of the agency, and that uh, you have, over the years, moved PBS Guam forward and moved them in new and positive directions. So that's very good to hear. And then if you have testimony that you wish to share on your behalf. Uh, good afternoon, Senator, Chair, Chairwoman Marsh. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here to testify in regard to my nomination as a board member for the Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporation. It has been my privilege to serve as a PBS Guam board member during the first five years of the Camacho administration and during the last four years of the Calvo administration. During those periods, I also served as board chairman. I am here today because I know PBS Guam has so much more to offer than it has been able to demonstrate in the last few years, and I would like to be part of this organization as it grows into adulthood. Yes. PBS is for kids, but it is so much more. As far back as 1961, national concerns were being voiced that children spend as much time watching television as they did in school, and that the TV programming content was lacking in substance. It used to be said that there were three great influences on a child, home, school, and church. Today, there is a fourth great influence, said Federal Communications Commission Chairman Newton Minow in a speech to industry professionals in May of 1961. Television was the fourth great influence and it was not living up to its promise, Minow said. Of broadcast television, Minow said, when television is good, nothing, not the theater, not the magazines or newspapers, nothing is better but when television is bad, nothing is worse. To the industry executives watching him speak, he said, I believe in the people's good sense and good taste, 
and I am not convinced that the people's taste is as low as some of you assume. Remember, this was 58 years ago. Now, with smartphones and Wi-Fi connectivity, people have access to all kinds of programming all the time. And when it's bad, it's really, really bad. So in a move to provide a more balanced television landscape, the Carnegie Commission on Non-Commercial Educational Television in 1967 issued a call to action that led to the creation of the Public Broadcasting Act signed into law by President Johnson that year. The act established the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, known as CPB. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood debuted in 1968, and Sesame Street followed in 1969. Also that year, the CPB established the Public Broadcasting System, PBS, the CPB's program distribution arm. NOVA, Frontline, the PBS News Hour, Antiques Roadshow, Downton Abbey, This Old House, The Magic School Bus, and Clifford the Big Red Dog are just some PBS prob programs you likely know of. In 1975, the Guam legislature created the Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporation, which is the license holder for our PBS station. That was 44 years ago. In my opinion, PBS Guam is not performing as well as it could be, given the time it has had as an organization, especially in regard to producing independent, original programming, which is a key component of our mandate. It is the consensus of the current board that the main reason for our failure, our failure, to perform has been inconsistent management. During the last administration, for whatever reason, the station saw five general managers. To try to break that cycle, the board wrote to then-Governor-elect Leon Guerrero in December, outlining our concerns. Governor Leon Guerrero responded by appointing Ina Carrillo as station manager. Now my concern, given our experience, is keeping Ina Carrillo as station manager. I think I can speak for the board in saying we are excited at the prospect of having someone of her caliber in a position to lead the station through this administration and beyond. Speaking for myself, I like working as part of the PBS Guam team because I believe public television is more likely to reflect the best of our communities, global and local, than other media. It is part of the mission. And it is proven that people imitate what they see on television or screens of any size. If I can be in a, if I can be in a position to encourage capturing, capturing our community at its best, and reflecting it in order to perpetuate those characteristics, making my community a better place, then I'm happy to do that. If I can help young people gain access to meaningful, interesting information and education that they can relate to, I'm happy to do that too. If I can be part of an initiative to create the next generation of Micronesia, Guam storytellers, I really want to be a part of that. Thank you again for this opportunity to explain why I have been involved with Guam Public Television and why I would like to continue serving the community in this fashion. Sisuismaasi, Mr. Donovan uh, Brooks. And you know, you did outline quite a few important things and they were important to hear. Outlining some of the needs of our communities, outlining some of the ways that uh, other types of television programming uh, don't, don't meet our needs or uplift the community in important ways. So thank you for spending some time in, in going through those issues. Certainly, I followed along and understood a lot of what you were saying as I reflected on a lot of the programming we see today. Um, I don't know how else to say it, but some of it uh, is quite shocking to me, having grown up in different eras, uh, some of what is put out there for everybody to potentially hear or see or be molded by. So I agree with you that PBS has a, in a very important role within our community towards providing very wholesome or 
uh, informative programming that isn't always available in other types of um, media that are out there. Some of what I noticed in your background is I think these are skills um, and experience that you bring with us that you have worked within uh, newspapers, so other forms of media, that you are also a photographer and journalist. And so I think that that really brings something to the table for PBS, um, understanding the role of media and how it interacts with the community. So I, hope so. I appreciate that. Oh, no, please go ahead. I just wanted to say that I hope so. I hope I bring something to the table. Definitely. Um, and so it's good to see those uh, experiences. And, and part of what's been really good to note is that the different board members, they have these different educational backgrounds. And I'm a great believer in teams. And so um, whether it be educational from one group or um, other types of concerns from another, uh, certainly I think those are great experiences and skills that you bring with, a, uh, w with yourself there. Um, and so having served on the board for many years now, some of the typical questions about understanding the commitment of time, obviously you're very well versed in that and you're very committed with your time. Uh, that really is reflected in the supportive testimony from the station manager that she sees your commitment and that hard work that you put in. And um, certainly having been there at that period of time, you understand that if there's any conflict of interest um, that you know how to carry your, conduct yourself uh, in the meeting um, at, at that particular time. You mentioned this being a time where things are, are moving forward in a positive way. The station manager is in place who's really carrying it forward. She believes in your leadership quality as well. So together, uh, I think that you two will continue to bring PBS forward and um, help it continue to contribute to our community in the many ways that it can. Um, you know, with those things being said, um, I don't necessarily have a lot or any questions, but just noting those particular um, elements that you've highlighted and the station manager has highlighted. Is there anything else that you would like to bring forward or? Um... No, I'm just really happy to be here and uh, have you understand, um, you know, my position. Well, again, Sidious Masi for coming out and um, I look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, we'll be very supportively putting your committee report together and then bringing your nomination back onto the floor. So thank you very much, Senator. Sidious Masi for taking your time this afternoon. You're very welcome. So what we can do is uh, continue with the nominations rather than, uh, since we already have uh, the next person here, rather than necessarily taking a break uh, and going into recess. So as a reminder from Mr. Brooks's um, confirmation hearing, the committee will continue to receive testimonies for the next few days. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Haganya Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs, and submit it via email to office.senatorkelly at guamlegislature.org or to my office located on the second floor of the Guam Congress building. So, um, Let's go ahead and 
move into the next nomination for Ms. Rosemary A. Clement. And it is uh, 145. We will now begin the confirmation hearing of E. Magahaga's nominee, Rosemary A. Clement, to serve as a member on the Board of Trustees, Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporation, also known as KGTF PBS. And I want to mention again that there are some members from PBS. Ms. Ina Carrillo from PBS as the station manager, and Christine Flores de la Cruz, who have both come to provide their support. So in just reading a little bit from Ms. Carrillo's testimony, uh, she has very favorable testimony for Ms. Clement. She points out some of your background. So as I was mentioning earlier, how um, the board, I think, is served very well by having people from various backgrounds that each are bringing some of that difference uh, with them. So she notes that you're an experienced educator. You've been living and working on Guam for over 30 years. So I think uh, you're very plugged into our community in those ways that you've been a lifelong supporter of PBS, that you have participated in every PBS Guam event, and that you really are working towards the good of PBS, uh, and that is at the heart of things for you. So with that, um, I know that you've been here for a couple of the times that I've gone over the uh, procedures, so uh, I think we can go ahead and just have you turn your microphone on, make sure to state your name, and then provide your testimony. Uh, my name is Rosemary Alice Clement, and um, as you know, I am a retired teacher and definitely a lifelong supporter of public television. I grew up in New York, and um, I remember Leonard Bernstein's con <laughs> concerts, on, uh, children's concerts on television when I was just a little girl. And my, in fact, my whole family were big supporters. Uh, my mother and I always watched Masterpiece Theater, and I think it was called something else then, but all the dramas and all that. And um, I, I concur with what Donovan said about the importance, uh, especially now with television being such an influence on children, and there's a lot of really bad television. And I think that uh, public television and PBS in particular has such wonderful programs for children, and not just young children, but uh, programs like NOVA and, and all the cultural activities. I think they're, they're so great. Uh, I mean, you can see a Broadway play on PBS. Uh, so I think it's, it's just so seriously important for our program, for our station to grow. And um, Ina has done a terrific job. Uh, she's, and as Donovan said, we really want her to stay. One of our problems has been having consistency in management. And as you know, in any business, uh, any activities, you really have to have consistency. And um, she has done, one of the things she's done, a remarkable job in fundraising, which of course we desperately need that to, for programming and for uh, equipment in our station, which a lot of uh, was in really bad repair. And um, I think, you know, we're on the road more than I thought the first four years I was on the board, uh, mainly because I think we're really, got a really good team together. And I'm just really hopeful that we'll have more uh, local programming and, thank you, <laughs> and more, um, more participation from the community. You know, we do have our own readathon and we have a program for children to become members. And I think as a early childhood expert, you know, if you get children <laughs> when they're young, then you have support for hopefully for their lifetime. Um, I, I must say that when I first came to Guam almost 33 years ago, one of the first things I did was to go to PBS and volunteer. Uh, it was so long ago, the general manager was an Asian man. I, I don't remember his name, but 
I remember he, he sent me to public health for some kind of a survey. So <laughs> I've really started, you know, right away uh, supporting public television and continue to do so now. Okay, I don't know if you have any questions. But. Sidhu Masi for that. And, uh, you know, as you were speaking about uh, some of the local programming and the readathon and some of that, um, it reminded me of some of the discussions that I had been hearing earlier that the board had been working together to think of some additional local programming. And, you know, I don't know about other communities. Guam's pretty much the, the yeah. community that I really know, but yeah. I, I know we love watching our local sports and watching our kids do well yes. uh, in the Academic Challenge Bowl and other programs. Yeah. So I think the more that we're getting those opportunities to yes. see parts of our community and, and people that we know um, or places that we're familiar with, that that's going to be something really special that you guys are going to be continuing to build up. I, yeah, Academic Challenge Bowl has been going on forever. And <laughs> my son was on that when he was in eighth grade. I mean, it's been around forever, and I think it's really popular. And, of course, when you get local kids doing stuff, everyone in their family and they have millions of relatives are watching it and supporting us. So that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is a really important program that's been going on for well, a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, very long. Uh, if I remember right, uh, some of the people who were there in the very beginning, I think, were the Bothmers. And uh, they're an I'm old, sorry, who? The Bothmers, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and so they're, they're an old teaching family that were here in the old days with my parents when they <laughs> first came out. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't recollect all the history there, but uh, I seem to recall yeah. that they were there in, in those early days. Yeah. And some of what you were mentioning, uh, both you and Mr. Brooks, about the type of programming that PBS offers, um, I've always been drawn to what it offers about historical periods. And some of the programming, like something that I had watched a, a year or two or so ago, was where they walked people through these different decades and helping people understand the difference that, you know, the 1890s and the 1900s and those years that are somewhat a long time ago on one sense, but really not so long ago in another sense. And just really getting uh, more solid understandings of what poverty looked like and what oh. middle class looked like yeah. and, and what your average person on the street. Um, so it's that type of quality programming, yeah. I think, that it's, it's not just drama and it's not just these other things, but it's really interesting history, I think, by seeing people living through it um, or having people recreate parts of it so that you really understand some of those historical eras. At yeah. least that's some of what I've been drawn to. Well, I think a lot the of the, uh, the dramas on Masterpiece Theater actually are historical and reflect in great detail what it was like. I mean, you think of Downton Abbey and what the, you know, the different classes were like in those days and how people lived and, and I Call the Midwife, which became incredibly successful, uh, portrayed you know, what poor people in London were doing starting in the late 50s, and it reflects it's a reflection of history. It's an intimate look at one group of people and how, how they you know, were taken care of by the midwives. And it's just, I just find that fascinating. Because I am a history buff. And so I'm, I'm really interested in that aspect because a lot of the drama is, is very pertinent to certain periods of history. And you really get into details of it, as well as like the straight history programs. And also, I'm very interested in the fact uh, that there are so many cultural shows, uh, you know, as Broadway plays, ballets, operas, dramas, that, um, that people in Guam who don't get to travel very much never have the advantage of seeing, and they can see them right there in their living room. So I think that's a great contribution. Uh, I, I do as well, as you know, and I see that history uh, interests run in your family. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and 
So with that, um, I mean, we've talked about local programming. We've talked about some of the programming that they do offer. Are there any other additional thoughts? Um, I, I unfortunately hadn't remembered to quite ask Mr. Brooks uh, at this, this question, but in the discussions that you have had as a board, are there any thoughts about directions going forward um, other than the ones that we've mentioned already? that you'd like to talk about or just interest or potential? Well, although I am not a scientist, I know that NOVA is really important and it's a, it's a way of uh, teaching us about science in layman's terms and I think that's really important and we've had some support from the medical community and uh, we hope to increase that support uh, because I think that's something that's really important because STEM is so important now and um, I think that's one, one uh, venue for us to get in contact with young people, well, anybody, but especially young people in high school and college thinking of careers in science and engineering. So I think that's something that we'd like to have more support for. Sujus Masi for that. So unless there's something additional that you'd like to um, to add to your testimony. If there is not anyone who has not yet testified, there being none, this committee will conclude the confirmation hearing of Rosemary A. Clement to serve as a member on the Board of Trustees for the Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporation, KGTF, PBS. And then as that reminder, the committee will continue to receive testimonies for the next few days. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Haganya Revitalization, Self-Determination, and Regional Affairs, and submit it via email to office.senatorkelly at guamlegislature.org or to my office located at the second floor of the Guam Congress Building. The time is now 1.57 p.m. and uh, we will take a short recess until we move on to the next confirmation hearing. Sidus Maasi to everybody who came here this afternoon. Thank you, Senator.